Hey folks, JR, back for another episode of Echoes of Shannon Street Case File. It's going to be episode 44, Reloading in the Kitchen. Before we get uh, started, get that subscribe button. Also get a chance at the link in the description. Follow my podcast. Get your copy of the book, the documentary. Come on over, visit my Facebook site or my website. Follow me on Twitter. All right, folks, we're going to take a statement from a TAC officer named Rutherford. He was on the primary assault team. We're going to see what his version of the events were. It's going to be the statement of Don Rutherford. Relative to the hostage situation at 2239 Shannon. Troman Rutherford, how long have you been employed by the Memphis Police Department? About 12 years. What is your present assignment? I'm with the Police Department Tactical Unit. How long have you been with the TAC unit? Approximately seven years. What is your duties in the tactical squad in regards to the hostage situation at 2239 Shannon? My particular duty tonight was to be on the primary assault team to assault the house. Officer Rutherford, on Thursday morning, January 13, 1983, did you have the occasion to be involved in the assault at 2239 Shannon? Yes. Officer Rutherford, I will ask you to state in your own words and in detail what your duties were in regards to this situation, what you observed and what actions you took during your assignment. It was determined that we were to make entry into the house. I was to be the second officer to enter from the rear door on the south side of the building. Of course, I had my primary area of responsibility upon entering the house. Tear gas and other provisions were to be used prior to entering. A signal was given for the use of tear gas and entry into the door on the south side of the building. Directly upon making entry, we received fire from the den kitchen area. The assault was to be made by our four initial officers and two backup officers. Upon receiving fire, return fire into this area, kitchen den area. Tear gas and sound flash devices, artillery simulators, were thrown into the house for diversionary purposes and to cover for us. We, like I said, returned fire to the area in which we received fire. We then progressed into the area we received fire, which was the den kitchen area of the house. We didn't locate anybody in that area. A few officers went into the a hall area right at the kitchen, and to get into that area, you have to pass a hallway directly to your left. Now, he's referring about the hallway that leads to the southwest bedroom. They passed through that hallway safely. Correction, they passed in front of the hallway safely. When my team relief passed through, I started in behind him. Directly down the hall, one or two subjects appeared in a doorway down the hall and started shooting down the hall towards us. They fired three or four shots, I believe. I couldn't see. All I could see mostly was muzzle blast. It was very dark, a lot of tear gas, and ate a lot of smoke. I had a flashlight taped to the end of my M16. I put the light on them. I caught a glimpse of the subject's hand. At that time, I fired on the subjects on which I ceased fire. Later on, one or two of them were found dead. We continued on in the direction we were going, into the central hallway and into a bedroom. Now, he's that central hallway he's referring to, they're walking into the kitchen and then heading to the northeast bedroom that was directly off the kitchen. I thought I saw a subject in the bedroom. Now the rest of this is cut off, but he's referring to, he thought he saw a subject in the Northeast bedroom. I thought I saw it again. I fired. It was later determined there was not movement in the bedroom. Apparently it was a reflection from the light. We swept down the hall, myself, and found Officer Bob Hester, laying face down, handcuffed just by the front door. He was obviously dead. We rolled him over, looked at him, 
And at that point, we hollered, we've located the officer, and we were going to take him out on the front porch. While we were doing this, the rest of the assault team was still moving in about throughout the house. We placed Officer Hester on the ground, sidewalk, just off the porch. Called for a doctor to come up and look at him. The doctor ran up quickly and said he was dead, and we told the doctor to get back under cover. He went back. When we entered the house, we went with full intent to only identify and be conscious enough to eliminate threats to ourselves. When we make an assault, usually you do a search along the way. This was not done in this incident because we felt sure they were going to be ready to ambush us and that we needed to do was to locate them and isolate them. We knew there was the possibility to miss somebody. We started to sweep back through the house and two officers went in front of myself and my partner, down, back down the hallway, in through the kitchen area, and they disappeared down in there somewhere. I came down the hallway and looked into a room at the end of the hallway to my right. He's referring to the Northwest bedroom. I looked into the room at the end of the hallway on my right, and there was a subject on the floor scooting across the floor going for what I thought was a weapon. I fired on the subject. I struck the subject, and I believe he was DOA. I continued to go through searching for other subjects, and the two men that were out front of us located another subject in another bedroom that popped up on them, and they returned fire. That subject was DOA. I think he was behind the bed. I didn't see it. But later on, I saw him behind the bed. We continued to search. We were concerned about an attic and continued to search for an opening and couldn't find one. Found something over the bar in the den that looked like a plastic part of the ceiling. I broke that out, stuck my head up in there and looked around and it was determined that there was no one up there. We continued to sweep all the way to the south side of the building and didn't locate any others. Then we went back through and made a more thorough search for an entry into the attic area. We did not find one. We then went to the front of the house and called in officers to secure each room. Officers were designated to stay in each room and secure the scene. Primary assault team then left the house. Myself and another officer picked up Officer Hester and carried him and placed him on the stretcher. Then we went to the command post, which was two houses east of the suspect's home. Pretty much stayed there. I think, in fact, did go back to secure my M16, which I laid down to carry Officer Hester to the ambulance. Officer Rutherford, you stated about the south door. What door would that be? The door on the south side of the building, in the rear, the back door. Who was your partner at this time? At this time was myself, Bob Watson, Charlie Summers, and Kay McNair. The shots fired into your direction, other officers' direction. Do you know how many, approximately how many shots were fired? After we entered, there were sounds, flash and artillery. And I felt like I was sure of like one or two rounds. Bob Watson was the first officer in the door and I was second officer. He was already firing back when I entered the door. I then fired back also. I think at that point in time, he and I were the only ones that fired may have been others. As soon as I entered there, I went to my designated area responsibility. I was either shot, hit in the back, or artillery simulators threw some crap from the house to hit me in the back and knock me completely off my feet. I laid there for a minute, started collecting myself, and got back up and went on. In your statement, you stated that after clearing the kitchen den area, you went to the hall and were confronted by subject at the end of the hall. You stated you fired upon them. Approximately how many shots were fired? I believe three or four. I believe two subjects were standing in the doorway where the shots were coming from. I only saw one set of muzzle flashes. First of all, I saw and heard was muzzle flashes and I had a flashlight taped to my M16 barrel. When I returned fire, I saw figures standing at the door, one or two. 
I returned fire approximately three rounds, at which time I saw the suspects fall back into the room. Like I say, it was either one or two suspects there. There was a lot of tear gas in the air, and we had gas masks on. Smoke was very dense, and I couldn't see at all without the light. Describe the type of weapon you fired. I was firing a cold M16 weapon. The electric fire is usually 223 magazine fit. Approximately how many shots did you fire from this weapon? During the confrontation or during the whole incident? Whole incident. 40 to 45 rounds. Did you have to reload your weapon during this incident? If so, tell me approximately when and position where you had to reload. Yes, I did have to reload my weapon. I had a 30 round clip of my M16. To be truthful, I'm not sure if I had to reload before the first confrontation or just after. I do remember reloading in the kitchen. As a matter of fact, then it says inaudible simulator. There appears to be some handwriting underneath it. I don't know what he said after that. Were you injured? Something did hit me in the back, and I had two vests on. I had my heavy vest on and a lighter vest on under it. Of course, I was knocked off my feet, but as far as any injury, I don't believe so. Officer Rutherford, do you know the MPD number of your weapon, the serial number? The MPD number 513 and the serial number I don't have right now. I'll have to call you later. What race were the occupants? Did you see any type weapons? Yes, sir. I saw two, 38. What looked like 38. Thought I saw another one, but it couldn't have been a firearm. It was very dark and very smoky. Saw one weapon in the room where the subject was shot behind the bed and the room where the other subjects were laying. Like I said, when we passed through the first sweep, and we came back through, we had the confrontation again. Patrolman Rutherford, in your statement, you stated you found Officer Hester in the front room, at which time you said you could hardly recognize him. Could you explain why you could hardly recognize him? He had obviously been severely beaten. There was blood, dry blood all over his facial features. He wasn't mutilated, but just obviously had been beaten severely head, face, and whole body. He was covered in dry blood. He was handcuffed with his hands behind him, laying face down, was laying right inside the front door. This is the end of the statement given by Patrolman Rutherford. Below it, there's a note, January 26, 1983. Did you fire any type weapon besides the M16? No, sir. Okay, folks, crime scene diagram showing the den kitchen area. The primary assault team initially entered. They've all said they received fire from the den kitchen area. Then they move northbound into the kitchen. That's when they said they then received fire again from the area of what was the southwest bedroom. Rutherford said he fired rounds back down the hallway at one or possibly two suspects in, in a doorway. Now, it's not necessarily the doorway of the southwest bedroom. They could have been near the doorway of the northwest bedroom. Rutherford said he reloaded in the kitchen, 30 round clip. From there, the team continued northbound into the northeast bedroom. Rutherford said when he was in the northeast bedroom, he cranked off some rounds at what he thought was a suspect. He said it ended up it was light reflecting off of uh, I don't know, a mirror, glass, something. Other than that, it was uneventful. And then from the northeast bedroom, they went into the living room. All right, Rutherford said he got in the living room and they carried uh, Bobby Hester's body outside, laid it on the sidewalk, and came back in. And he's talking like uh, even when they're taking the body outside that 
Rutherford said after he left the living room, he went southbound down the hallway from the living room, looked back to his right, which is the northwest bedroom, and he saw a suspect scooting across the floor. He shot him, and that's pretty well it. He, he talks about the suspect in the southwest bedroom. It's almost an afterthought. Okay, folks, that's going to wrap it up for this episode. I've just got issues with the security squad and their, their questions. Rutherford talks about, mentions his partner, and for once the investigator actually asked, All right, who is your partner? And then Rutherford just names off the whole team, and the investigator never comes back to him and says, who is your partner? And there's another another part of his statement where he, he talks about there were two officers out in front and they went another way. The investigator asked, never asked him, who were those two officers? You've got to ask these questions. And then the investigator asked the race of, the, uh, of a person that was shot, of a suspect. Well, that has nothing to do with anything. Does it matter? No, it doesn't matter. Security Squad's mission is, is, is to investigate and find out if the officers were justified in using deadly force or asking what color somebody is. That doesn't matter. The, the investigators just, they, they, they don't do any follow-up questioning. They just, they just let it just run. I, I don't know what their intent was. Now, we will have an episode and we're gonna talk about why probably some of these security squad statements were not, they weren't, weren't very well taken. And then we'll talk about why it wasn't a good idea for statements to be taken from all these police officers when they were, because every one of these police officers, they had their statements taken, patrolmen, TAC officers, right then and there. Those TAC guys and those uniformed patrol officers, they had been up for days with little or no sleep, days. And then they're gonna go through a traumatic event and then you're gonna to talk to them. But anyways, we're, we're gonna have an episode and that's all we're gonna do is talk about that. That's, that's not an excuse for anything. I will tell you the years I was in security squad, that's changed. We no longer, we no longer talk to an officer right after a traumatic event. We wait 48 to 72 hours before we talk to them. And that's based on research, medical research, that says you'll get a better statement if you wait. And years and years in the robbery bureau, homicide bureau, and security squad. And I'm telling you, on these investigations, you get one shot at it. One shot, and that's it. You've got the crime scene, you've, you've got all these officers, and if you don't get it right the first time, there's not a do-over. And that's what the shame of it is. But we're gonna, we're gonna talk about all that when we have that episode dealing with these issues. But anyways, we're gonna go over that. We're gonna go over why security squad was under under the gun literally taking these statements. Because you can tell from the quality of the statements that they were just, they were spitballing this thing. Anyway, that's enough of that crying for me. Folks, we'll be back in a few days, do another episode. And as always, I'll see you down the road.